everyone, Chris T here from The Depot bringing you another informative video about how to make Run 8 more realistic and how to follow some real world practices. Today we're going to talk about hazardous materials and placement of cars within a train. We'll talk about where hazmats can be and where they can't. We'll go over buffer cars and when you need one, and we'll also cover how to build trains realistically and how to space certain cars within a train. Before we start, the usual disclaimer applies. We'll talk about things that we do on NS. Other roads might have different rules regarding train placement and other car restrictions, so I'm going to go with what I know best. Also, none of what I'm about to cover is a rule within the depot servers. These are just pieces of information that you can utilize to make the sim closer to the real thing. Let's go ahead and get started. First of all, let's look at some of the tank cars in Run 8 that handle hazardous materials. You have the following car names that have actual placards within the sim. You have Tank 105 Acid, Tank 105 Acid Dirt, Tank 107 BN01, Tank 107 GATX02, Tank 107 GATX03, and Tank 107 PROCR01. These cars all have hazmat placards on the sides. On our server, these cars are used to represent customer orders that require a hazardous material regardless of what that material is. So now that you know what these cars look like and what their file names are, let's go ahead and see what we can do with them in a train. Here we have a sample train. Two locomotives, five box cars, and two tank cars. This represents the head end of a train and our first example of hazmat train placement. There are several different rules regarding the placement of hazmat cars in a train, including how close it can be to locomotives, adjacent cars with shiftable loads, next to mechanical reefers, and more. In Run 8, one of the easiest things to simulate and to also not notice is how close hazmat is to the locomotives. One of the restrictions out of NS's hazmat rulebook, the HM1, states that when train length permits, must not be nearer than the sixth car from a locomotive or any occupied caboose, shoving platform, or passenger car. If length does not permit, must be near the middle of the train. This means it can't be within five cars of any of the above. Unit trains like oil and ethanol are exempt from this. So in our example here in front of us, we're in compliance. The hazmats are at least five cars away from the locomotive. Notice it doesn't mention an occupied locomotive. Any locomotive, regardless of whether it is occupied or not, counts in this case. You would also want to consider this placement if you're using a DPU. Here's another scenario to think about. Let's say you have this train here, and you need to make a set out en route. You're leaving block A, which is properly spaced for your hazmats, in the yard, and will be returning to the train, and now block B is at the head end. Now you've got hazmats right on the head end against the locomotives. This train is no longer in compliance with hazmat rules. So you've got to plan ahead when building trains and yards to make sure you'll have a good head end and a good rear end when departing. Alright, let's take a look at this situation. Here we have a local, three covered hoppers and three tank cars. Looks like we have a problem, right? Not in this case. Because the train is only six cars long and three of them are hazmats, they can't be at least five cars from the engines. So the latter part of the rule applies that says if length doesn't permit, they must be near the middle of the train. I sometimes see locals where people have put a buffer in the middle of a train ahead of the hazmat cars. That's totally unnecessary. Any car in that train counts as a buffer if it keeps the hazmats deep enough to not be an issue. Buffers are really only for unit trains or if you don't have any spare cars to keep the hazmats away from the units. Now we have another possible hazmat issue, shiftable loads. Here we have a train with good hazmat spacing until we come to these gondolas loaded with pipes. This is the best example of a shiftable load in Run 8. You could simulate others with the coiled steel cars, but this one is the most obvious. These pipes could, in theory, shift in route, either through rough train handling or maybe something holding the load in place broke and now the pipes are moving around. The pipes could slide into the tank car, puncturing it, and a spark could ignite a fire or even cause an explosion. This would be something a yard master or a yard crew would handle while building the train. Alright, one last hazmat scenario before we move on. We've got another train here with the hazmats properly spaced. 
but now the issue comes up that we've got loaded hazmat against a mechanical reefer. That's a no-go. There must be one car between the reefer and the hazmat. The rule also states that it's any mechanical reefer, whether it's loaded or not. Now, you can have an empty hazmat car against a reefer, but not a load. I've had to set a reefer out at Conway one time before for this very reason. These scenarios are the most common ones you'll find in Run 8. One more thing to cover are key trains. Key train is a term used to describe any train hauling one or more loaded tank cars carrying poison or toxic inhalation hazard materials, 20 or more car loads of any hazardous material, or one or more loads of spent nuclear fuel or high level radioactive waste. Now we don't technically have any poison cars unless your server or you yourself simulate that, and we definitely don't have any nuclear materials. But the 20 or more loads of hazmat is definitely possible within the sim. On our plus servers, we have some transfer facilities that will take 20 or more tank cars, and we also have unit oil and ethanol trains, like this one right here. These would be key trains. Key trains have a max speed of 50 miles per hour and are also subject to high threat urban area restrictions. This means that they would have to go at a much lower speed than track speed, depending on the area and such, usually 40 miles per hour. Also, key trains that go into emergency for any reason must be inspected in their entirety as well as if they get a detector not working or train too slow message over a defect detector. These are things you could simulate in the sim or during a session to make things a little more interesting. Okay, now we're going to move away from hazmats. We can briefly cover some of the other train placement issues that you could simulate. One thing is what we call trailing tonnage. On NS, empty cars over 85 feet long have trailing tonnage restrictions. Depending on the territory, you can only have so many tons behind these cars. You would need to look up the appropriate routes timetable to find these numbers. Territories with steeper grades will have lower trailing tonnage ratings. Flatter routes will have higher trailing tonnage ratings. This is because you don't want a lot of weight pushing against a long empty car like that. It could literally pop the car off the track and cause a derailment. So far, the only cars we have that fall under this category are the empty intermodal flat cars like these. Cabooses are another interesting piece of equipment that gets frequent use. These should be handled on the rear freight trains and should not be subjected to helper service. On the depot, we allow cabooses to be shoved at 30 miles per hour, so that's another thing to consider when utilizing them as a shoving platform. Also, going back to hazmats, Hazmats may not be within five cars of an occupied caboose. One last piece of information to close out our video today. When practical, it's best to have the loads on the head end of a train than at the rear. It makes for better train handling if you don't have all that weight running into you every time you go to slow down or touch the dynamic. And for the same reason as the 85 foot flat cars, excess weight against all those empties can pop a car off the track. If you get a good bit of slack running in, all that energy has to go someplace and it'll find the weakest point. Alrighty guys, that'll do it for our little video today. Nothing to do with running a train, just how to build them, how to handle your hazmats and other uh, train spacing within them. I hope you guys appreciate this video, learned a little something. You can take what you learned here into your next session or into everyday operations within whatever server you run on and put it to good use and see if you can build trains with all this proper spacing and uh, try to keep it within compliance. As always, I thank you guys very much uh, for watching and hopefully we'll see you out there. Take care and have fun, guys.